turn this off. Testing. There we go. I think uh, Officer Cox pulled me over a few times. <laughs> it was you, wasn't it? God bless him. <laughs> and God bless all those who were victimized by him. <laughs> Amen. Turn in your Bibles. I have three short texts. Uh, turn to one of them, uh, Esther chapter 2. <coughs> Esther chapter 2 is where we'll go. Not much room on this skinny little pulpit. <laughs> Human behavior is a mystery. All you have to do is pastor for a little while and you come to that conclusion. Why are people the way they are? Come on. Why are you the way you are? Have you ever wondered that when you consider, when you consider the variety of possible personality traits, trends of behavior, attitudes, ways of responding to life, treating people. Why is it that you behave the way that you behave in life? Bring it. What is the explanation for our character and our personality, your habits, your attitudes? The way that you respond to life, the way that you react to relationships. Is it all just random? Is it simply the luck or the bad luck of the draw? The reason why you got a funky personality? Come on. Or a contentious character? Why is it that way? Is it all just random, or is there actually a specific cause? If you see somebody limping, for example, in life, they have a physical limp, you know that person has had an accident. Something has happened that has caused that to take place. Well, the fact of the matter is that, that in life, uh, a lot of people are emotionally uh, and spiritually limping, as it were. And the very things that are our greatest hindrances uh, and problems in life uh, are not anything external uh, that is opposing us, uh, but they are the internal issues uh, of our own heart, our own attitudes, uh, our own character, uh, the way that we behave, the way that we act in life. I know a lot of sinners that have a better disposition than a lot of Christians I know. Come on. And it seems that so often we hit a lid in life. Whether we're in ministry, pastoring, or we're in one of the churches, we're aspiring to do the will of God in our life. Every so often we hit an obstacle and a barrier and there are some of those barriers that people don't get past Amen. because of what's going on inside their heart. There has been a lot of talk in recent years about childhood trauma. And of course this is a very legitimate discussion because all of us here are shaped by childhood experiences for good or bad. And childhood experiences, uh, trauma if you will, they go a long way to defining us uh, and many of the things uh, that we battle with as Christians in life uh, are things that do not, do not get resolved uh, at the point of conversion. Uh, there are things that survive our conversion uh, and need to be dealt with down the road. It's almost like there are two layers in our lives. There's the layer of sin that is dealt with at conversion for sure. We're forgiven, we're set free, we're delivered, we're washed in the blood, we're on our way to heaven. But then there's another layer of very deep-seated issues.
issues of life. And that is what the blood of Jesus is for post-conversion. How many know we still need a lot of delivery in our lives? Amen. There are a lot of issues that linger beyond our conversion that God needs to help us with. Yes. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled Surviving Childhood Trauma. Someone wrote these words. Nearly every research, uh, nearly every researcher agrees that early childhood traumas, those that happen before the age of six, uh, lie at the root uh, of most long-term depression uh, and anxiety and many emotional and psychological illnesses. Severe traumas can even alter uh, the very chemistry, uh, physiology, uh, and psychology of the brain itself. Uh, among mental health professionals uh, and even some childhood development specialists, uh, there is sometimes a lack of understanding uh, over uh, exactly what constitutes uh, childhood trauma. A 1992 uh, study uh, defined childhood abuse uh, as a repeated pattern of damaging interactions between parents or presumably other significant adults and a child that becomes typical of the relationship. In addition to physical, sexual, and verbal abuse, this can include anything that causes the child to feel worthless, unlovable, insecure, and my son better not be saying amen right now, by the way. <laughs> And even in danger, I forgot he was going to be here for this. Uh, or as if his only value lies in meeting someone else's need. Examples uh, cited in the report include belittling, degrading, uh, or ridiculing a child, making him or her feel unsafe, uh, including the threat of abandonment, failing to express affection, uh, uh, caring, uh, and love. So again, the point is, that what happens in childhood can have a very long shelf life and in many cases it, it, it is part of what we need to be delivered from. The reason I preach this today is because this has very much to do with your destiny. I've seen a lot of people's destinies undermined and hindered and even abandoned for this very reason. They cannot get over, escape from childhood trauma. And I want to minister on this because interestingly enough, it is a major feature uh, in the Word of God. And I want to minister on overcoming uh, childhood trauma, surviving youth. Uh, three texts. You've turned to Esther too. Uh, but listen as I also read from Judges and from 2 Samuel. In Judges we have the story of Jephthah. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore sons, and his wife's sons grew up. They drove Jephthah out and said, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers, dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah, and went out raiding with him. So what's happening in Jephthah's life, the trauma of his youth, his birth, the way he was treated by his brothers is now playing out in what is shaping his destiny and his future. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we have the story of Mephibosheth. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul, the king, and his father Jonathan came from Jezreel, that they were both killed in battle. And his nurse took Mephibosheth and fled, and it happened as she made haste that he fell from her arms and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. And then we have the story of Esther, the one that you turned to. Verse 5 of chapter 2 in Shushan. The citadel, there was a certain uh, Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish of Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives. Uh, these are the parents of uh, Esther. Kish had been carried away 
from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured in, uh, with Jeconia, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up uh, Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. Uh, the young woman was lovely and beautiful uh, when her father and mother died. Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the grace of God and for the word of God. Lord, I pray for powerful anointing and deliverance and cleansing and washing and transformation of heart, oh God. We thank you for the power that's in the blood to set the captive free. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. I want to talk first of all and make some comments about childhood trauma. In the absence of a spiritual perspective about our lives, very often we draw our wrong conclusions. Well, Pastor, it is because of what I've been through. This is who I am. This is how I am going to act, how I'm going to behave. This is how I'm going to conduct uh, my, my finances, uh, my marriage, my relationships. Uh, this is who I am. This is how my life has been shaped. Uh, and very often, the very thing I'm talking about becomes the reason uh, and the excuse uh, for everything that is wrong in our lives, uh, for personality uh, conduct uh, that we know is not of God. If I asked you this morning, uh, how many of you... Uh, uh, you know that there, there are attitudes, uh, ways of behavior, uh, ways that you speak, thoughts, uh, and uh, ways of conduct uh, that are not of God in your life. Most of us would raise our hands. The second question is why? Why do we make room for things uh, that we know are not of God? Because sometimes they are so deeply entrenched, uh, so deeply embedded, uh, we believe that we have a justifiable reason and cause and excuse. Come on. It has legitimacy. Prisons, criminal behavior, divorce, violence, all kinds of destructive behavior, we know sociologically is traced back to childhood trauma. People that have been abused or abandoned or have uh, uh, been traumatized by divorce or molested, uh, or in their upbringing there was an absence of love uh, and affection uh, and approval. Uh, we understand, you don't have to be a Christian, uh, uh, understanding the Word of God to know uh, that these things cause deep uh, problems uh, that linger through the teenage uh, and into the adult uh, years. And this has become the norm. Most people that come into our churches are limping very badly. You say, Amen. Amen. Stuff's happened, hasn't it? Trauma has transpired. And many of you are sitting here today, having been saved and converted. Is this on? No. no. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. This will be a wreck. <laughs> Is there something I am doing or not doing that is making the microphone not work? On the breaker trip, I think. On oh, the breaker trip. Let me turn my own personal breaker on. Oh. 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 So the point is that this has become the norm today. People come into our churches limping, having been traumatized very badly. It's very rare that we get anyone in church that has not been traumatized in some way, shape, or form. There has been abuse and abandonment and divorce and violence and a lack of love and appreciation and value in life. As a matter of fact, the Bible prophesies that in the last days, uh, there are going to be perilous times. Listen to what that verse says uh, in light of what I'm talking about. Know this, that in the last days, uh, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, uh, lovers of money, boasters, proud, uh, blasphemers, disobedient uh, to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, uh, slanderers without self-control, 
brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Think about how many of those things that I just read are relational. And when you are the victim of someone who is a lover of pleasure, more than a lover of God, or a man who loves uh, themselves uh, more than they love their wife and their children. Uh, it is for sure uh, a very dangerous time uh, to be alive today. Yeah. To be a child. <laughs> My wife and I were in England recently, and for the first time in England, we saw billboards uh, uh, advertising uh, abortion. The various uh, abortion service uh, agencies uh, are now free to advertise in England. Uh, in America, there are 1.5 million abortions uh, every single year. Uh, not even uh, is a mother's womb a safe place for a human beings. Come on. Come on. Once a child comes out of the womb, depending on the environment, uh, in which they have been born, uh, very often uh, it's dangerous uh, and it is traumatizing uh, and it is a very difficult circumstance. Now let's look at our three stories. First of all, we read about Jephthah. There we go. Uh, Let me know if you can tell any difference. <laughs> In verse 2, the Bible says, Jeff, Gilead's wife bore sons. When his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So here's a young man, Jephthah. He's done nothing wrong himself. He had the misfortune of being born as a result of a one-night stand by his father and a local prostitute. The prostitute, when the child was born, delivered the child to his house. His wife took it in. I guess no questions asked. We don't see any of that in the text. But she takes the child in, raises the child, perhaps loves the child, but the other siblings do not accept him. And from early childhood, he's never included, he's rejected, he's made fun of. And of course, in the earlier years of childhood, they can't do anything about it other than ostracize, reject, and make fun of him. But as soon as they come of age, the father dies, and the Bible says uh, that they put him out of the house. Uh, they rejected him. They drove Jephthah out. Uh, and Jephthah fled uh, from his brothers. Uh, and this begins to shape uh, his attitudes. Uh, it begins to shape his choices uh, and his decisions in life. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that worthless men banded together with him. What powerful impact that can have on a young man. It contributes to the forming of character, the decisions made and the attitudes that, that develop. Someone defined social rejection this way and said social rejection occurs when an individual is deliberately excluded from a relationship or a social interaction. It includes bullying, teasing, ridiculing, or the more severe forms of divorce or abandonment. I read an article, it was actually in USA Today some time ago. It's called The Johnson Family Legacy Finds Layers of Love and Loss. A lot gets passed down. Listen to this article. This is a news article in USA Today. A lot gets passed down from generations and Samuel Johnson knows uh, that he will leave behind more than a family business valued at seven billion dollars. His four children he knows could inherit the predisposition to alcoholism that he inherited from his mother. And can, they can inherit insecurity, such as one that has haunted him since childhood, the one that makes him wonder if his own father so loved the Johnson Company that it threatened to crowd out the love for his son. John, Johnson spoke of these deep insecurities passed down from his father. Herbert Fisk Johnson, the grandson of the company founder, divorced his alcoholic wife and was absent from Samuel Johnson's boyhood for months at a time. Samuel eventually took over 
day-to-day -day operations of the company at age 37 after his father suffered a stroke. But his father continued to demand to see the company books every other weekend when he would often tell his son, I don't like these numbers and I don't like you either. You're fired. Johnson said he knows that it was his father's illness talking, but that does little to soothe the emotional handcuffs that lasted 13 years until his father's death. Whether he loved the company more than me is really an issue that I still struggle with, Samuel Johnson said. He was so passionate about the company, so driven, that there wasn't a lot of room left for anyone else. Trauma. It forms character and can determine destiny. Let's consider Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth had a physical handicap, and on top of the physical handicap, uh, his life is characterized uh, by very severe circumstances that befell him through no fault of his own. The day that is described in the text that we read uh, was uh, the quintessential bad day for someone. He's five years old. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's being looked after uh, uh, by a nursemaid. Uh, his father and his uh, grandfather, King Saul, are out to battle. They both die in battle. This little four-year-old boy, uh, no doubt, loves both of them, uh, is aware of both of them, is very attached to both of them, uh, and they die in battle one day. Uh, and on top of that, uh, because of the fear uh, of what was going to happen to this heir of the throne, uh, the nursemaid takes him uh, to flee away from danger. Uh, she falls, uh, he falls, uh, and he is crippled and lame from that point uh, until the end of his life. Some years pass. David is wanting to find someone from the house of Saul uh, that he can show favor to. Uh, and so someone tells him about Mephibosheth. He takes Mephibosheth uh, and adopts him almost like a son, uh, blesses him, uh, and, uh, and gives him a place uh, at the king's table. Uh, but sometime after that, uh, someone came to him uh, and told David that Mephibosheth uh, was involved in the rebellion of David's son Absalom. Uh, and unfortunately, David believed it. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, David takes away all of his possessions uh, and all of the wealth uh, that he had given him. Uh, that, was, uh, that was eventually straightened out uh, and worked out. Uh, but the point here that we need to understand is that things happen in life that are not your fault or your doing. Yeah. Stuff comes down. Things happen. Fathers and grandfathers die in battle. Accidents take place that produce injury. Misunderstandings happen in life uh, and we're victimized uh, by perhaps a slander uh, and gossip uh, that is not true. Uh, and so these things can happen uh, through no fault of your own uh, and they can be crushing uh, and they can be a traumatizing blow uh, and they contribute to defining many people's life. Many people are angry because of what's happened to them because it wasn't your fault. I mean, if you go mug somebody or rob a bank and end up in jail. There's nobody to get mad at but yourself. No. But if you're falsely accused, if an accident happens and you're victimized and you're, and you're lame, or you experience a, an inexplicable loss of a loved one, through no fault of your own, all these bad things have happened uh, and many people are left in the wake of that very angry uh, and that anger, sometimes it's anger at God, uh, anger at life, uh, anger at circumstances, uh, sometimes that anger uh, is the catalyst uh, that determines destiny. Then we have Esther. Esther was raised in captivity and both her parents died. Similar to Mephibosheth, uh, by no doing of her own, Mordecai brought up Esther, for she had neither father nor mother. Captivity, not her fault. Parents die in youth, not her fault. Tragedy can happen. Trauma can happen. You can be victimized by the sin of others. And people often ask the question, Pastor, why is it that bad things happen to good people? There is no explanation other than it's life sometimes, unfortunately. 
Matthew put it this way, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Think about Job. The Bible describes Job as the most righteous man in the east. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. So sometimes as adults, we can barely handle the trauma that we have to experience in life. We have hopefully uh, some emotional maturity uh, and a solid foundation uh, to be able to handle uh, and process uh, the things that happen to us in life. I thought about Pastor Warner. Accidents like the one he went through where his back was broken. Uh, sometimes those kind of things uh, are enough to put somebody on the shelf uh, in bitterness and anger and regret uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, others like Pastor Warner uh, have the emotional uh, and spiritual stability uh, to weather the sword storm and still continue in destiny. Now let's talk about dealing with the fallout of trauma. Because all the above has consequences. It can become what defines us and I would say that in a crowd this size there's a lot of that. What is defining your marriage and hurting your marriage is this issue. And sometimes we defend our position. Well, it's the way my mother was. It's the way my father was. It's because of what happened to me. How many women, they think they, they, they're traumatized in life, uh, maybe by abandonment, maybe they've been sexually uh, hurt or abused, uh, and so they lose the ability for closeness and intimacy uh, because uh, they are shielding themselves and protecting themselves uh, from being crushed again, uh, but they marry. Marriage needs intimacy. It needs closeness. It needs relationship. Uh, and a wife like that can genuinely love her husband, uh, but because her character uh, is dominated by this feature, uh, it undermines her marriage uh, and causes great problems. Uh, and I've overseen the divorce of couples, uh, not because there was no love, but there was an inability to love. Because you go into a marriage limping and you think that just by virtue of being married, the limp is going to be healed and it's not. Jephthah, bitter and angry, he is. You would be too. Driven away from his home with no possessions. Lonely and afraid. Mephibosheth, an accident, why me? Why did all this misfortune have to happen to me? What did I ever do? Why is God angry with me? He might have thought. Loss of loved ones. I mean, everything happened to him. Loss of loved ones, father and grandfather, accident where he's lame, and then misunderstood and rejected. Esther. Born into a circumstance nobody would have chosen for themselves. In captivity... Parents died, raised by her older cousin. These traumas, listen very carefully, this is the point, could have profoundly affected these three individuals in ways other than it did. So many people today allow childhood trauma to be def the defining moments of life in the texts that I read, the three texts. These childhood traumas are mentioned, but they are only mentioned in passing. They are not what defines these individuals as far as their destiny is concerned. They are things that they got past and were able to process uh, and move forward. These are facts about their lives, uh, but it doesn't define them. A lot of stuff happened to me in childhood, happened to you in childhood. The question is, uh, are you going to let that continue to define you, uh, or are you going to plead the blood of Jesus uh, to break the curse and get healed so that you can walk in the destiny of God? 
And there is one single word, I think, that characterizes the reason for that. And it is the word destiny. God has a destiny for your life. Amen. Nothing needs it to interfere with that. The destiny was in place before you were born. Come on. You're born, stuff happens. Yes, it does. Painful things happen, but you still have a destiny. You still have a destiny that originated with God. The question is, are you going to allow the trauma to derail you? Or are you going to lay hold of God for the destiny that was in place before you were born? And recover from trauma, be healed from it, and move forward in the will of God. <laughs> Jephthah, Mephibosheth, and Esther. There's a purpose behind their birth that originated with God himself. Jeremiah, one of my all-time favorite verses that has had so much meaning to me personally, uh, before God said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, before you were a twinkle in your father's eye, before their marriage, before, their, before all of that in eternity, God knew you and had a plan and had a purpose for your life. You see, there is a spiritual force and dimension to every life that began before you were born. You are not an accident. I don't care what the circumstances were. You are not an accident. God knows who you are. Before you were born, saith the Lord, I knew you. And I think sometimes we have a wrong idea about destiny and the future that God has for us. We wrongly think that our destiny started the day that we got saved. And that's partly true. When I gave my life to Christ on May 22nd, 1975, in Pastor Harold Warner's living room, on that day, I began to walk in the destiny that God had for me, but it wasn't established then. It, wasn't, it was created in eternity. You may have stepped into it the day you got saved. You may have had opportunity now to advance the will of God in your life. But the will of God for your life and the destiny that he chose for you began before the world did. That's why the testimony of these three individuals is so powerful. They're traumatized. They have tragedy that they have to deal with, rejection. There's no explanation from God to satisfy the God why. they got to deal with it. They're victimized by others. Some of them are by circumstances. The point is they survive, and it doesn't affect the destiny that God had for their life. Jephthah, you know the story, becomes a judge of Israel. Circumstances can turn in a heartbeat in a moment's time. Mephibosheth is restored. His possessions, his lands are all restored to him. He is given servants and wealth and blessing and favor. And then on top of that, he has a seat at the king's table for the rest of his life. Esther, we know the tremendous story in the book of Esther when her cousin said, perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, this little Jewish girl traumatized by the death of her parents, born in captivity, every disadvantage you can imagine is used by God in one of the most critical moments in the history of the nation of Israel to save a nation from utter destruction. And she was probably no more than 15 or 16 years old at the time. Your destiny is not determined by or need not be determined by events or trauma 
or the past or the inexplicable or the hardships or the pain that you have been through in life. Uh, your future is determined by choices, not by events. Amen. Are you listening to me this Amen. morning? Amen. So the problem is we allow ourselves to continue to be victimized by what's happened in the past. How many people, you may be sitting here tonight, there's unforgiveness and bitterness over a suffered wrong. You know what the Bible says about forgiveness. You know the Bible says if you can't forgive your fellow man that trespasses against you, God will not forgive you. You know that. You know that when you stand before God on Judgment Day and there's unforgiveness in your heart, you know there's going to be rejection by God for you. You know all that, but unforgiveness still prevails, doesn't it? Why? How can something be so deeply embedded as to defy what we know to be true from the Bible? We know that our conduct is our pastor, uh, thank you for that sermon, by the way, preached, uh, some wise struggle with their attitude, their conduct, their behavior, knowing that it's not right, not biblical, uh, not a consequence uh, of godly virtue. And that's why I said I know people who are not even Christians uh, that have a better disposition uh, than some of God's people uh, who are contentious uh, and unforgiving uh, and hold a grudge uh, and walk in disobedience, etc., etc., etc. These three, I don't have any doubt, struggle because of the trauma. They had every excuse to be bitter, to quit, to run, to give up. But listen, there is a force to God's destiny for your life uh, that no trauma can undermine if you'll choose righteousness. Amen. I want to close by telling you three stories. And this is actually what inspired this sermon. Because there really are a lot of modern day Jephthahs, Mephibosheths, and Esthers, and I know three of them very well. The church in Norwich, England has been open since 1984. I've preached in that church revivals in various uh, discipleships and rallies and such things. Now they have Harvester's Homecoming. But I preach in that church more than in any other church I've been invited to. And so because of that, I have known these people for nearly 30 years, some of them. I knew a lot of them when they were single, they married, had children. Now I know their children as teenagers or in their early 20s. They've grown up in the Lord. So I have a very unique and very special relationship with this church. My wife and I were there I was preaching at their Harvester's Homecoming last August. And I began to look at three of the young people that I know there. And I know them because of the tragedy I know that they've been through. And I'm watching them, and I am deeply moved as they're involved in ministry. One of the young girls is singing, another one is playing in the band, another one's leading songs. So I was so moved because I know their backgrounds. I know what these kids have been through in life. And so I made it a point to sit him down with my wife. I wanted to talk to him and interview him as kind of like an interview and ask them, because I have young people in my church. You have young people in your churches and perhaps their story about how they broke through in their lives can be a help to us. The first one I talked to was Charlotte Watts. Her father, I've known since 1984, he and his identical twin brother got saved in a Billy Graham crusade in the spring of 1984. The very next week, Nigel and Yvonne Davies opened up that church to pioneer it. They came in and became two of the founding members of that congregation. Some years later, in 1992, this young man married Rebecca. And then shortly after that, Charlotte was born. So, they are there in the church. He wants to preach. He gets sent to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Cambridge, England, to pioneer. And they're there for a few years. Uh, and over the process of time, uh, the father backslides. 
The father abandons the family. The father takes up with another woman. And you can only imagine the horrible uh, trauma by this time. Charlotte, uh, I think, is five or six years old. Her and her mother go back into the Norwich church. They continue to serve God. And as I'm talking to Charlotte, I'm telling her, I'm saying, listen, if this is too painful for you, uh, Charlotte, you don't have to talk about this at all if you don't want to. And she looked me in the eye and said, Pastor Stevens, uh, it's not painful for me anymore. And she began to tell me that when she was five years old, she answered an altar call in church, gave her life to Jesus Christ. Uh, and she said from that moment on, uh, God was so real to her. Uh, yes, this was awful. It was horrible. Uh, and it continues to reverberate uh, as she has a very... Uh, problematic relationship with her dad to this day but she said these words what has saved me was my relationship with Jesus my mother continuing to serve God and then she said at the earliest possible time that I could I started getting involved in ministry started serving God involving myself in others and today if you saw her you would not see any evidence uh, unless you talk to her and heard her story that there's any trauma. She carries herself with dignity and with confidence, uh, serves in ministry uh, and functions. The other individual is a young man by the name of Ian Galt. I was preaching a revival in Norwich in 2007 and I had heard about his sickness. When he was 15 years old, or 16 rather, he was diagnosed uh, with leukemia. And when I was preaching there in 2007, uh, he was in the third year uh, of very uh, difficult chemotherapy. Let me put it this way. He'd lost his hair. He'd lost weight. Uh, he weighed about 115, 116 pounds. He's six foot tall, uh, uh, very sick, uh, came to church, sitting in the back. Uh, I called him forward, prayed for him uh, at that time. Uh, uh, and then when I'm seeing him at this last revival in August, he's got his weight back, uh, full head of hair, uh, song leader, uh, uh, very powerful uh, uh, disposition. Uh, and so I sat him down and talked to him, and he began to tell me the story. He said, when I was 15, I backslid. I got involved with drugs, uh, smoking weed, drinking alcohol. Uh, but he said, after about six months or a year of that, uh, I realized uh, what I was missing out on. Uh, I went back to church. Uh, I rededicated my life to Jesus Christ uh, and began to serve God. I felt the joy of God in my life again like I never had before. Uh, and knew that I had a future and a destiny. Uh, it was three months after that. I was playing basketball one day. Got short of breath, uh, collapsed on the basketball court, uh, was rushed to emergency, uh, diagnosed uh, with stage 4 leukemia, had to immediately uh, uh, subject himself uh, to very strong doses, uh, and it lasted for three years uh, of chemotherapy. He told me... I always knew God was real, never doubted his reality, never blamed him. Jesus had made himself so real in my life that when I rededicated him, not even the diagnosis for leukemia could cause me to doubt his love for me. But there's more to the story. At the age of 19, his father backslides, adulterates, leaves the family. His older brother and sister backslide. He and his mother continue in the church. He still has a strong faith. And one of the things that he said uh, that helped him so much, he said, I watched my mom through all of that trauma get stronger and stronger in her faith in Jesus Christ. They held on to God Amen. through the trauma. Amen. Meanwhile, his cancer goes into remission. As I said, his hair grows back, his weight comes back. He's feeling healed. They say it's in remission. We believe he's been healed. Amen. The weekend that I was there, uh, Pastor had asked him to lead songs for the first time. And I'm telling you. And Pastor told me, listen, I've asked this kid, uh, Ian, to lead songs, uh, and I'm a little nervous. I don't know how. He tore it up. <laughs> Felt convicted about his relationship with his dad that very night, before I just the day before I talked to him. He went home called his father, witnessed to his father, testified to his father, forgave his father, told me that he felt more free and liberated 
that he ever has in his life. And he said to me, Pastor, the reason I'm alive and I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing my future and destiny is because of my relationship with God. I know that, and I know people like you have been praying for me. Ian and Charlotte are actually engaged now. One trauma plus another trauma equals a powerful marriage and destiny. <laughs> There was another young man, and this was most inspiring to me. I've known this young man for many years. Jonathan Kant is his name. My wife and I uh, left England on August 28th of 1994 uh, to come back and pastor the El Paso Church. And uh, that weekend just happened to be a pastor's meeting that the Walthamstow Church was hosting, and so we were all there. We stayed for the Friday, or the Thursday rather, and then on the Friday, we left for the airport and flew back to England. The day before we left, uh, Pastor Brown brought, brought us a prayer request because a couple in his church uh, had had a baby, and the baby was very, very sick. He had a serious case of jaundice, which does happen. Some of you may have had children with mild or serious cases of that. But he had another condition called hydrocephalitis which was bleeding in his brain. And this was causing a, a huge amount of pressure and damage was being done. And the doctor said if this child lives, he's going to have 90 to 95% brain damage. And the doctor actually told the parents and said, I am not afraid this child is going to die. I'm afraid this child's going to live. Because if he does, He's going to have 90 to 95% brain damage. So the parents told the doctor, you know what, doc? We're going to pray for a miracle. We're going to give it three days. That's, this is exactly what they said. That's how long it took Jesus from death to resurrection. And so we're going to give it three days. Keep him on the ventilator. Keep him breathing. Keep his vitals going. Amen. We're going to pray and we're going to believe God for a miracle. The third day, no change. It's evident. So they unplug the ventilator. They're weeping. They're praying. And as they unplug the ventilator, this little guy starts fighting and breathing and struggling for life. And a day passes. And then two days pass and a week passes. Within, uh, within eight weeks, his weight doubled. Five weeks later, he went home. Three months later, he went back to the hospital. Uh, this is January of 95 has a brain scan, all clear, all gone. <laughs> Think about destiny. Not even hydrocephalitis can undermine a destiny that God has for someone. Yes. When Jonathan was three, he picked up some drumsticks, and by the age of four, he mastered the drums. Incredible to watch. When he was about seven years old, they were over at someone in the church's house. He got up on the piano bench and started playing in a way that the mother thought, well, wait a minute, this kid's never sat at a piano before. So she took him to a music teacher that she knew from college, and after a few lessons, this music teacher said, your son has a very rare gift. It's called perfect pitch. And I asked Jonathan, what does that mean? Because I certainly don't have it, and neither does <laughs> He said, well, the best way I can explain it to you, Pastor, is when he says, I hear music in my head. And he said, when I hear a song, I can go to the piano and play it correctly immediately. No messing around. Perfect pitch. He plays in the music uh, worship team. And he said, you know what? I, I've been writing songs. And I said, man, I'd sure like to see those songs you've written. He said, well, I, I haven't actually written them down, but I've thought of them, and I could write them down for you. So the last night I'm preaching, uh, I'm thinking he's taking notes, but he's writing all these songs down, but he's written only in his head. <laughs> years before. So one of them was four years previous. He thought of it, had all the lyrics there. So he writes it down, shows me the lyrics, and I, it's, his handwriting's worse than mine. He says, hey, you may have perfect pitch, but you don't have perfect handwriting. <laughs> so 
So I said, why don't you get a guitar? And I took her name and went into the office. And this guy started singing. And I want to tell you, heaven fell in that room. As he's singing, his testimony, one song he sang to us was about Jesus coming again. And another one was just about loving God. And he finished and he said, Pastor, you know, you know what my name means? I said, no. He said, my name, Jonathan, means gift of God. My middle name, Michael, means who is like the Lord. And my last name, Kant, is an old English word that means who leads the singing. And he said, I believe I have a destiny in God. No childhood trauma, no sickness from birth, no declaration from the doctor that said, be better off dead than alive, could stop the flow of what God wanted to do in my life. Stop allowing childhood trauma to define you. Stop making excuses for behavior that you know is not of God. Because God's will and God's destiny for your life is far more profound, far more powerful than whatever it is that you may have been through. And I empathize with people for what they go through in life. But you know what? This may sound cold and callous. It's time to get over it. Come on. It's time to get healed and let the blood of Jesus set you free. Let's thank the Lord.